as is our custom, I'd first of all like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the country in which we're meeting today and extend the same respect to all of you and your families and your collective ancestors along the mine. So thank you very much. It's these kinds of gatherings that invoke in all of us the rights and responsibilities of upholding the foundational principles of democracy. The man after which this particular centre is named, Ron Caston, responded to this democratic invocation. Ruthless in his execution of decisions on behalf of justice and armed with a moral compass that never swayed in the long litigious battle to win land rights recognition in Australia. Ron Caston, with Eddie Marbo and other, Miriam to who I'm related, held firm in the belief that all men are born equal and different. This belief and the challenge of terra nullius that ensued not only changed the landscape of Australia, but the history of the world forever. Great things happen when the populace has moved to do something great, to change the course of history, to hold true to the principles of democracy and recognise the principles of both equality and diversity. Hence, I was humbled to be asked here today, but grateful for the opportunity to discuss in the next 30 minutes or so the importance of doing something great, of changing the constitution of Australia to both further the outcomes achieved for Indigenous Australians in the 1967 referendum, and to finally recognise that in our country, we are made up of old and new Australians. I've titled this speech, No Winners, No Losers, Just Truth, Justice and Mercy. Whilst we all can and should do something great, I have a growing disquiet that asking that expecting the majority of Australians to vote yes in a referendum to include First Peoples in the body of the Constitution and to removing the clause that allows for discrimination based on race in the next three to five years or so will fail. And a failure in this arena would confuse a lot of Australians about our nation's values and about how serious it is in getting rid of racial discrimination to create a level playing field. I also believe that there would be a negative impact on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and for all Australians for at least a generation. I want to explore together three key issues in this speech. The first is to review the current discourses framing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and the responses that we have to the reform process. The second issue will be to identify a campaign in which every individual is precious. And in understanding this preciousness, engage in a new and a genuine dialogue with other Australians, old and new, about our collective position and place in this nation. And finally, I'd like to provide an alternative discourse in that which is currently popularised and what each of our roles in it could be. And now is the time to speak of these things. All over Australia, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and communities are taking charge of our own lives. We have more resources, better education, technologically advanced, um, sorry, technological advancements, and we have a depth and diversity of experience with which to enrich Australian life and identity. And if these things offer hope, so does the fact that Australians are now better informed about cultures and achievements, better informed of the injustices that have been done and better informed of our dreams and aspirations than any generation before. All of the leadership are future focused. And in our own way, we believe deeply that we want to all move in the same direction towards a better future for our children and grandchildren. So what does our leadership say about constitutional reform? Leadership in the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples and in the Australian Human Rights Commission have consulted our communities and found widespread support for constitutional reform. There are two points that are consistently important to First Peoples. Firstly, we state that it's important to reconstruct our national identity to include the oldest living culture in the world. And second, we state that it's important to remove provisions within the body of the Constitution that permit enable or anticipate racial discrimination. If these two points and options are considered in an upcoming referendum, then Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders believe that there are opportunities to improve the status and the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Addressing the history of exclusion of our people in the life of the nation, increasing our sense of self-worth as citizens within Australia, 
and entrenching the protection of human rights for all Australians in the Constitution, it is believed, will build a human rights foundation upon which to build a reconciled nation. Other leaders have sought to define the reforms as a test of national maturity. Maturity would call for a preparedness on part of all Australians to recognise the violence and disruption to the lives and cultures of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. <coughs> this would mean understanding the history of nationhood, the experiences of colonisation, and as a nation, seek to redress this violence through an act of constitutional reform. This would make it possible to move on to our shared futures as citizens of one united Australia, in which all of our futures are inescapably intertwined, and we are at a fundamental level, one people. Megan Davis, an advocate and lawyer who has spoken of the need to focus the attention of the nation to the fact that the constitutional reform will completely unfinished business between Indigenous peoples and the state and address the most urgent and immediate priority <coughs> in Australia, the disadvantage experienced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Reform, she says, will come about as a result from engaging Australians <coughs> who have low levels of civic knowledge in an education program encouraging them to vote yes. This requires a historic change. Australians have shown in many referendums, if they don't know, they vote no. There is a current conversation among our people on the important issue of sovereignty. Gee, look, am I jumping through? Yes, I am. Some believe that sovereignty is the most important end game in nation building. The establishment of tent embassies all over the country epitomises this. Country men and women who occupy these tent embassies have a strong message that we shouldn't participate in constitutional reform. Indeed, to participate in constitutional reform undermines our sovereignty. There are many advocates in our communities who say that constitutional reform upholds the sovereign rights of people supported by the findings from the expert panel who went to great lengths to give advocates confidence that sovereignty could be dealt with through this process. The sovereignty movement is based on the fact that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people did not sign agreements, did not hand over country, did not extend it, um, extinguish native title, and are occupied people living in an occupied state. The leaders of this movement assert the right to sovereignty and the desire and opportunity to be recognised through a treaty process <coughs> premised on equality. There are four main discourses that seem to then frame constitutional reform. As I said in the first part of the speech, I want to review the current discourses framing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and our responses to the reform process from within our communities. So far, there are four. And the first is a human rights discourse that posits Indigenous recognition of the Constitution as an opportunity and a human rights entitlement through which there can be a strengthening of the UN declarations on the rights of Indigenous peoples in our domestic affairs and a true recognition of equality under the law. The second discourse is on advancing reconciliation and currently there seems to be two schools of thought on the ways of doing this. The first is to recognise um, the title of First Peoples in the preamble and offer nothing more. The second way is to include First Peoples in the body of the Constitution to show that we are all citizens in a reconciled, unified nation. We are all equal and our future as citizens of this nation is intertwined. The third discourse then is about achieving national maturity in which our nationhood recognises our shared history, demonstrates a preparedness to recognise the equality and diversity of its members and all citizens and prepare and participate in a deeper appreciation of each other. And the fourth then is the issue of sovereignty which recognises that this country was never ceded. Self-determination in the context of country is believed to be the oldest de democratic entitlement and the rights cannot be incorporated into a nation state. What is interesting to me is that all four of these discourses mirror those found by my dear friend, Dr. Rosemary Aldridge, who examined speeches and documents delivered by federal politicians since 1972, and she found two things. First, that there are four key ideas about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples which pervade official conversations, and these four ideas concern frames of control and responsibility, capacity and competence, the nature of the problem, and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as not us, 
of the Yapo. Secondly, Dr. Aldridge found that policies enacted by these federal politicians, after all, enacting policies is what politicians are elected to do, have been consistent with these four ideas. And if language is used in the policy environment, and if it represents Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as not competent, irresponsible, the source or cause of the problem, and not us, then it's little wonder that policy emerging from that environment, entrenched in the limited view of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, it comes forth and delivers the kind of poor outcomes that we've seen in a lot of our communities. And it's my view that all the current paradigms that govern our way forward in the discussion about constitutional reform arise from and are within response to these four same discourses. No winners or losers here, people, just the same old, same old. So what would a new discourse need to achieve? If we as a nation put aside the indigenous question in relation to constitutional reform, what is the current compelling case for changing the national constitution? Is it the clause that allows for racial discrimination? The clause that fails to recognise Australia is one of the most culturally diverse places on earth and to a large extent this cultural diversity has been achieved peacefully. In the words of Noel Pearson in reference to whether the constitution has worked for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, the constitution is broken, has been broken since 1901. Therefore, it's strategic on our part not to talk about compromise where some Australians will win and the others will perceive that they've lost something. We need to come up with a proposal that is a win-win for all Australians and the space for Australians to become engaged not with the Indigenous issue, but all of us together, across cultures, seek to remove the racial discrimination in the founding document of our nation. In this way, we have to be unified within our communities and with other communities across Australia. We will need to have discussions together about how to ensure equal opportunity and citizenship rights, what Australia both expects and takes for granted, and make them available for Indigenous Australians. Equality is quite simply everyone's business. What we need are compelling narratives that will shift the she'll be right, mate. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And if we choose as a nation to continue with the view that states that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have deficits that can be fixed as a result of being included in the Constitution, that we are disadvantaged but we'll overcome our disadvantage when room is made for us in the nation state, then we'll not get the necessary reform to occur. This is because these kind of views have already been responded to in very public, political, policy and programmatic ways. There are already public responses to our disadvantage, our need to heal, and our need to be represented. For example, we might make an argument that constitutional reform will deliver a future together in this nation, but in the public sphere we already have the Stronger Futures legislation. We might advocate that recognising First Peoples in the Constitution will produce equality when there is a view that the referendum in 1967 already achieved this. We could say to the Australian public that a yes vote in the referendum to reform the Constitution will uphold our human rights in an era when a significant proportion of commercial radio listeners do not believe in an international human rights framework, let alone support the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We could say that the Constitution will see us healed, however we now have a National Healing Foundation if we seek to be represented in the founding document of our country, we've already established the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples, an organisation representative of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander members. If we continue to argue that constitutional reform will assist us overcome our disadvantage, we already have billions of dollars through the Council of Australian Governments to close the gap and reduce this disadvantage. If we make an argument that constitutional reform is a necessary platform for sovereignty. Well, we've now got 10 embassies all over the country and the recognition of the 40th anniversary of the 10th embassy in Canberra. If we talk about country, then in the public's view, we already have land rights and an increasing knowledge that 20% of the country is designated Aboriginal land. If we talk of promoting unity within the nation through constitutional reform, at the same time, we have a leadership publicly discussing the needs to address the issue of lateral violence in our communities, in our own ununified communities. 
If we talk about constitutional reform, will help us get work. Well, we have Generation 1 advertisements that still resonate with the Australian population. And finally, if we ask for acceptance and understanding, well, the Australian populace, with low civic knowledge, might say that this call for understanding is already addressed in the public realm through organisations like Reconciliation Australia. It could appear to those with limited civic knowledge that we are all asking for more, above and beyond what is already on offer, and turn them off a yes vote. What we need to design is a set of messages outside of the four discourses that have framed the political, public, policy and programmatic options for First Peoples into new discourses that are more readily acceptable to the diversity of people we now call Australia home. And to, to that point, I want to discuss here my second thing that I wanted to review, which is the need for a program of education about the preciousness of all peoples. Have I jumped again? <laughs> it's like a preview. <laughs> I wish it was the dark night rising. I'm sure you would be excited about a preview for that. <laughs> I think it's infinitely more interesting than what I'm just No, I don't. I don't believe it. <laughs> but now to my second point about the preciousness of all people. Whichever education program we design to engage people in the constitutional reform agenda about why First Peoples need to be recognised in the Constitution, we should at all times promote that we, the First Peoples, are inestimably precious people to each other, to other cultures and the world. We need to appeal to the common humanity of our fellow Australians, listen to and respond from the depths of our inner experience. We need to invoke a deep respect for individual preciousness. For I have to believe that among humans, love is often the first and most appropriate response to the preciousness of others. We need discourses that try to find a point of intuitive satisfaction and equilibrium in all cultures, not by attempting to identify moral principles that we might agree to or commit to. Rather, we should take the point that some conclusions are just not acceptable, that they violate a consensus as to what even can be contemplated as possibly true. It should be a violation to the consensus view that any race of peoples can be denigrated or controlled in any way by implementing the powers in a clause in a constitution. We need to speak to the commonplace truth inherent in all cultures in Australia, otherwise an argument of recognition of first peoples can gain no imaginative grip on its audience. If we want to invoke in the Australian populace a consensus view that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people should be recognisable in the Constitution, then we need to name the end game and embody all the ideals available to us to call this end game into being. And for me, the end game has to be about peace. We as Australians need to embody the ideals of peace and commit to the journey to get there. We need to engage in a genuine dialogue with other Australians old and new about our collective position and place in the nation. Understanding the preciousness of any life, hearing and listening to the truth, being accountable through justice and practice, mercy may be what it is required to get us to the end game. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples through this campaign will have to make a case for peace. This is a deeply challenging component of our campaign. Make no mistake, truth has some unbearable elements, though without it we cannot find peace. And the truth in all its fullness has to be told, heard and respected. As in South Africa and other places in times of conflict, when the truth is found, it sets people free. And there is only one truth of the birth of this nation. It is experienced differently. The truth resides in all of us. The truth is not ours to own. The truth can only come when the search for truth is genuine and authentic, when each person shares with others what they know of the truth. And there have been many attempts at having a dialogue about the truth. Those who have been able to stay in this dialogue then have sought the next step of the, the journey towards peace, which is to embody justice. To take up the task of justice is to make sure that something is done to restore the damage that has been done, 
to restore relationships and be concerned with accountability. This is to realise the preciousness of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and of other cultures and that we make an effort to restore relationships and to be accountable to the principle of equality in diversity. We are diverse peoples from diverse cultures. We are different and we are equal. Any instrument that undermines that equality needs to be eradicated, lest it degrades and humiliates us all. Love with accountability has changed behaviour and action. This is the real meaning of restoration. The purpose of justice then is to bring loving action and accountability to the words, my fellow Australians. Then it will be acts of mercy that will create for us a new beginning, a healed relationship between Australians and the First Peoples, a fully reconciled and unified nation. To be merciful on the road to peace is to know the frailty of the human condition and because of this, stand beside each other with acceptance, compassion and support. Acts of mercy are reciprocal acts of peacemaking in which forgiveness is possible. The combination of truth, justice and mercy will see us on a road to reconciliation, which is only possible to the degree that each person sees the place and the need for each other. Reliance on the law is not sufficient to reform the Constitution. We need a campaign that promotes all Australians living their lives free from discrimination, achieving respect and realising their aspirations founded on citizenship principles of recognition, security and certainty and a stake in the country. A campaign towards peace is one in which we empower each other through acts of truth, justice and mercy. The campaign that endures are those in which each voice and social energy it produces are incomplete without each other. And so into dialogue we must go. This is not a campaign in the media, this is a person-to-person -person campaign and it needs time to grow, evolve, to startle, to educate and revolutionise a system intent on stifling creativity, individuality and imagination. And at this juncture, action and authentic engagement with life is required of all of us. Our sense of who we are and sense-making of who we are together has to be justified through actions as only through action does life gain a proper direction and become filled with intentions and sense imparting projects. So what is a sense imparting project that can build support for a yes vote and a referendum? Nation building seems to be a project through which Australians can reevaluate their views and gain insights into themselves. Creating these personal connections through friendship or cooperation is one of the goals of human life. We do not live life only on the surface, lightly. No human can be excused from taking part in life. We are here, we are now, and it's our nation to build, and it's our story to make. So upon reflection, what would Ron Caston say was required of us at this junction of our nation building story? What would he suggest would give us successful recognition in Australia's constitution and make sure that it's changed? This is worth reflecting on because he was a deft advocate who achieved so much for the cause of human dignity and equality. Ron Caston was an unreserved believer in the need for our um, need for entitlement of Indigenous Australians and saw the need to share in the wealth of our own country. Not only was he a great champion and a fighter for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's rights, but he understood the material needs of people stuck in poverty and disadvantage. And then in this context then, nation building and the resultant story would need to incorporate our own leadership and influence. The consequent public discourse on nation building takes on quite different connotations, which brings me to the third and final component of my talk. I want to provide an alternative discourse than that which is currently popularised and discussed for each of our roles and it could be. First Peoples, we're not afraid of diversity or a divergence of views, and we're capable of accepting and nurturing a diversity of views, each equal to each other. We now have national agencies capable of harnessing the collective views of people and have framed national discourses that are traditional and innovative, collaborative, entrepreneurial, and in some cases, visionary. 
I'd like to think I have a lot to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> we are Australia's original innovators and inventors, and this is a tradition that we continue still. These notions can be germane to a discourse that will see constitutional reform achieved as a necessary component of the nation building enterprise. Leadership from within my communities needs to contribute to something bigger than the sum of all of our individual ambition and be greater than all the differences of birth, community or faction. And whilst our effort should be to engage and direct resources to people in poverty, we do have cause for celebration. Among our number, oh, it's already there. <laughs> Among our number are professors, lawyers, barristers, judges, teachers, health workers, doctors, nurses, academics, politicians, dancers, athletes. We have public servants, people who are trained in governance, in business, entrepreneurial thinkers and actors. We have people in decision-making and powerful roles. We have chief executives, chairmen and women. We have marine biologists, social scientists, rangers, researchers. We have people working in corrections, youth agencies. We have people who are lecturers, representing us locally, nationally and internationally. We've done our teaming in health, education, academia, national resource management in regional autonomy, leadership development, organisational management, youth empowerment in market media, in public policy, in land purchasing, business development, economic development, human rights and political strategy. We also must celebrate those who kept their children and families alive despite the great challenges in their lives and helped them to thrive. Some of us have been working in our affairs now for at least 20 years and are in positions to mentor others. We are and will be at the forefront of this nation building exercise. There are many instances where Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have successfully embraced new technology and we often take the lead in innovative policy and practice. Aboriginal medical services have pioneered some of the most innovative methods of delivering primary health care in the world and we were at the table in 1978 when the Alma Ada Declaration was made. In the Northern Territory it's been AMSEN that has been one of the most vocal advocates for the introduction of e-health and this innovation will benefit all Territorians. Mobile telephones have been embraced by Aboriginal peoples across the country and we're getting health messaging and mobile messaging now being introduced as an essential health promotion tool by our own organisations in Far North Queensland. We're also doing sustainable water use, we're developing alternative energies and the research currently underway examining possible Aboriginal burning practices is being used as carbon mitigation in this country. What it does is put its Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander pe people at the forefront of innovative thinking and design in Australia. And in businesses now we have young Aboriginal men and women working in private enterprise, managing their own companies that turn over millions of dollars of products and services every year. Not only can we help build the nation, but we can also contribute to the wealth and prosperity that Australia prides itself on, creating employment, using national and international partners, harnessing the opportunities and creating the capacity of many other Australians in the world. We've not had eight Australian of the years for no reason. This innovation makes us leaders in our own field and recognisable achievers and contributors to Australian society at large. Our way forward in Australian society will come about from our own actions and a change in the ways in which we use discourses to frame our contribution. In this, the final part of my speech, I want to share some signposts that mark the journey towards a dialogue so needed to reconcile this country, one in which we take responsibility to contribute and invite the contribution of others. This dialogue then mitigates any group of people being the acceptable loss for the greater good. Evoking excellence in our society therefore requires a deep appreciation of the necessity for diverse thinking, and of confidence in co-creating a society that is safe and accepting on the one hand and honest and challenging on the other. <coughs> From these dialogues might come new discourses that are drawn to peace. Huh? You missed that one, didn't you? <laughs> oh, too bad. There we go. From these dialogues might come new discourses that are drawn to peace and do much, much more than structure us as simply disadvantage and allows us to have our own individual life pattern and responsibilities and choose the way in which we contribute to Australian societies as collectives and in ways that are richly diverse. 
We cannot doubt that we've been given the intellectual vision, the spiritual insight and the physical resources we need for transitioning our mindsets and our language and our views of each other and who we can be together and demanded of in these times. In the end, then, what is called for is nothing more and nothing less than what all the world's great religions demand, that we do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Let us be our brother's keeper. Let us be our sister's keeper. Let us find the common stake that we all have in one another and let our politics reflect that spirit as well. For we have a choice in this country. It's not enough to give health care to the sick or jobs to the jobless or education to the children, but it is where we start. It is where our union grows stronger. I'll be tricked. Here we go, it's supposed to be the last inspiring hurrah. There we go, hurrah people! But this is where we start! Come on, give a big resounding hurrah! That's good. I'll get you to do it again in about two minutes. So steal yourselves. <laughs> because in conversations like this, in forums like this, when we engage with each other, this is where our union grows stronger. This is where our perfection begins. When we greet each other as equals, when we're celebrated for all that we do to enrich our nation, then we invest in a future for our children on terms that are celebrated in the founding document of this country. One in which Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are recognised as Indigenous peoples and a document that celebrates equality and despises discrimination. This is how we build a nation, 24 million stories and counting. Regardless of what combination of policies and proposals get us to this goal, we must, we must reach it. We must act. We must act boldly. Because we no, have a, no longer have an excuse for caution. Leaders no longer have a reason to be timid. And Australia can no longer afford inaction. That's not who we are. That is not the story of our nation's improbable progress. Never forget that we have within us the power to shape history in this country. It's required of all of us here today to be mindful of how our own language either reproduces the dominant, tired, anti-visionary discourses or engages with new paradigms of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leadership, community and identity. It's not in the character of many First Peoples to sit by as an idle victim of fate or circumstance, and neither should it be ours or any of ours in this room. For we are a people of action, forever pushing the boundaries of what's possible, Changing the constitution is possible. Making us all equal is possible. We're here together today. Thank you.